Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent former federal officials and special guests for a dynamic discussion of the most important political and legal topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. The nation's crash course in legal proceedings continues, shaping major political stories beyond even Donald Trump. After over five years of investigation and a plea agreement that came undone in court, Special Counsel David Weiss indicted Hunter Biden on three counts related to concealing drug use on a federal firearm purchase form. This rare charge almost never brought for cases like Biden's without aggravating circumstances raises questions about potential political influence from Republicans on Capitol Hill. The indictment, and even more, the trial that might ensue, provided a convenient, if fallacious, talking point for Republicans in the House who are spoiling to change the narrative of Trump's multiple indictments. The dysfunction of Speaker Kevin McCarthy and the House Republicans was on full public display. Bowing to pressure from the MAGA right wing, McCarthy agreed to back an impeachment investigation, but he wound up having to impose it unilaterally, flatly contradicting the position he's taken in the past because he lacked the votes to bring it to the floor. The apparent goal of his concession was to placate extremists to get them on board with a spending resolution to stave off another government shutdown. But for now, they seem implacable. Mitt Romney announced his retirement from the Senate and delivered an astounding broadside of the Republican Party, saying a very large portion of the GOP doesn't believe in the Constitution and nearly all hold Trump in contempt, but are too cowed to say it, much less act on it. Finally, the Department of Justice began a high-profile antitrust trial against Google, whom it is accused of anti-competitive behavior in its phenomenally popular search engine. Google countered that its domination in the market traced to the superiority of its product and that it benefits consumers overall. The landmark trial is the first against a tech giant since the Microsoft case in 1998, and it will likely shape future government regulation of big tech. To help untangle this web of law and politics, we welcome a really fantastic set of returning guests, each of whom is one of the most respected and prominent commentators in the country. And they are... Peter Baker, the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times, where he is covering his fifth presidential administration. He previously reported for the Washington Post for 20 years. He's an MSNBC political analyst and the author of seven books, most recently The Divider, Trump in the White House 2017 to 2021, which he co-wrote with his wife, Susan Glasser, and we covered in a Talking Books interview. Peter, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. Aaron Burnett, the anchor of Aaron Burnett Out Front, which airs weekdays on CNN and is one of the consistently sharpest and most incisive shows on TV. She's also the chief business and economics correspondent at CNN. She moderated the 2020 presidential primary debate and has covered the war in Ukraine extensively and from Ukraine. Before CNN, Aaron hosted two flagship shows for CNBC. Thank you so much for returning to Talking Feds, Aaron Burnett. Great to be here. And Josh Marshall, a journalist, blogger, and the founder of Talking Points Memo, for my money, the quickest and smartest political blog in the market. He also hosts the Josh Marshall Podcast, where he provides insight into the big political stories of the day. Josh, thank you so much for returning. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's begin with the charges announced yesterday against Hunter Biden. We tape on Friday here. It's a three-count indictment growing out of his purchase of a handgun in 2018 and his certification on the purchase form that he was not using illegal drugs when he allegedly was using crack cocaine. So there was a whole deal worked out here, a diversion agreement that would have kept him from being charged if he stayed on the straight and narrow for two years. Aaron, you had Hunter's lawyer, Abby Lowell, on your show yesterday, at least from his vantage point. How did it come undone? 
he was adamant that it is because of political uh, pressure. Now, obviously, he is not getting into the details of why the judge took issue with it in that room. But in terms of where they are now, first of all, he says part of the deal is still enforceable. So he thinks that this whole charge situation is in violation of the deal that they do have in place with the government. He was calling them what the Republican screamers and the MAGA group. But the only thing that's changed since the DOJ spent uh, five years looking into this and decided to have a couple of misdemeanor charges and a diversionary gun charge is the Republican screamers. And so he wanted to directly say it, but he was obviously very clearly saying that the DOJ was being politically coerced or forced or influenced, I guess would be the word to do this. And at least the two things in the public eye were this hearing and the screaming on on the Hill. And I'll just say the hearing and the plea agreements unraveling there really had nothing to do with him. If anything, it had to do with DOJ and just pretty sloppy lawyering. He wouldn't say it. Josh Marshall said it. You, uh, There's really no plausible explanation, you said, other than that House Republicans simply rolled Weiss. Why do you conclude that? As I said, I think it's just the only really plausible explanation of the shift. You know, there was a Times article that tried to piece together what happened, not just what happened in the courtroom, but leading up to it. And one of the interesting things there, and I think in that Times piece, they didn't say it always directly, because I think sometimes you're reporting leads very clearly to something, but no one quite says it directly. So you have to report it that way. And the impression that certainly came off in that report was that Weiss basically delegated to one of his subordinates to negotiate a plea deal. She was doing that. And while she was doing that, he seemed to kind of lose faith in the process and became more distant from it as it went on. And my impression, at least, is that that disconnect is probably what led to the wonkiness of the deal that led to a kind of falling apart in the courtroom that day. And that coincides with when this stuff was going on up on Capitol Hill. It's pretty hard to reconcile the two things. You know, one of the other things that at least the Times reported was that Weiss was basically telling colleagues, I don't want to do the thing that that special prosecutors often do, which is to say, I've spent four years, I got to got to get something. So I'm going to find something to charge that if I don't find anything, I'm not going to charge. And that's kind of what that plea deal was, you know, making him kind of clean up the mess of the tax stuff, plead to something, not a felony. And now with this gun charge, I'm sure you are right on the plea agreement stuff, but I have not seen any lawyer who can even point to another instance where this crime has been charged in this way. It seems like almost textbook selective prosecution. Now, that's not necessarily a defense at trial, but it's so night and day from what Weiss was at least seemed to be telling colleagues is how he wanted to approach this investigation. That's really the key point in my view. For my money, there's really no other possible inference out there. And the big point is, this is a charge that in these circumstances, without something extra, is just never brought. Everyone that anyone's even been able to point to has a real plus factor of the defendant committed a crime with the gun, it was a straw purchase, etc. You know, Hunter Biden not only doesn't have those, he has an unloaded gun for 11 days The other important thing, selective prosecution. It's a selective in that sense, as can be colloquially, but to actually have a remedy at trial for this, you need to show retaliation for the exercise of constitutional rights. That doesn't seem to be what happened. Peter, just wanted to get your basic take on the charges. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer, so I, you know, I don't have... A phrase that is said on every single talking fed by someone. So you're first at, at 15 minutes in. Okay. So I don't have any real thoughts on the uh, the legal issues. The Times reporting, I think, by my colleagues is fascinating, and, I, and I'm looking forward to more. As a matter of politics, what a difference the last two months have made if they had simply gotten into court, signed this plea agreement, got the judge to sign off on it, we would be in a very different place politically right now. There'd still be Republicans going after Hunter, no question about it, but it would be easier to portray it as just politics and and to put it to the side to some extent for the White House. 
now they're looking at the uh, possible trial and maybe, you know, two trials, right? In the middle of the campaign, right? If they end up doing the, the uh, what were originally the two misdemeanor tax charges, if they do those as a, as a separate thing. I think the, the reports are they're going to, and very soon, do the tax charges, but as felonies. Right. Which you presume is, you know, in part leverage to maybe get a plea deal back on the table, right? You you hit them hard with three felonies on the gun thing that you were willing to put into a diversion program, hit them on two felonies that you were originally willing to plead to misdemeanors with no time. I'm not a lawyer again, I'm not a prosecutor, but I would imagine the strategy is to, in any negotiation, is to play a hard hand in order to set up a negotiation and, you know, it's not pleasant for the president and his family, but my guess is a negotiated uh, resolution would be easier for them politically and maybe even personally if they could find one that they found acceptable. The problem for them is to the extent that they wanted this plea agreement to uh, give him some sort of an immunity from anything else, that doesn't seem to be on the table. And guess what? If you go to trial, you're also still not going to get immunity from anything else, right? So if you go to trial on these felony charges, you still don't get off on any potential charges from any business dealings if that's what they're worried about. And you're talking back in 2014, which the Republicans are trying to dredge up in impeachment. Although, let me just say, again, I am a lawyer, and and those, for different reasons, are going to be very hard to make. So sticking with the politics, first, you make the point that this is done to placate the screaming on the Hill, and Abby Lowell said the same thing on Aaron's show. Do we expect it will? I mean, is this going to now quiet the outcry from Republicans about Weiss's supposed light treatment of Hunter Biden? There's no question it won't placate them. But I also think, Gary, and I know CNN had this poll that, that we all saw, but look, the perception on this is a problem for the White House. It just it's the reality, right? 61 percent of Americans believe that Joe Biden was involved in business dealings with his son in Ukraine and China. 55% say he acted inappropriately regarding investigations into his son, right? So when you say, is this going to metastasize into something more, it's not just the GOP in the House. And you can say that they've changed the broader public perception. That may be the case. But that broader public perception that there is something more, it is there right now. That's the reality. I don't think we can ignore the fact that the delta between any actual evidence of anything. And I don't just mean like, you know, I see a lot of headlines, no direct evidence of Biden's involvement, right? There's no evidence of any involvement in anything. And I think the reality is, as journalists, for the press collectively, there's some responsibility for that public perception relative to actual evidence. And it's not just a question of like, you know, that sort of evidence, direct evidence, Not only is there no evidence of anything like that, there's all sorts of evidence pointing the other direction. One of the cardinal things that the Republicans in the House are yelling about is an easily and obviously discredited claim that was the basis of why Trump got impeached four years ago. So one of the dimensions of public opinion in our era when public trust is so low is that no one wants to be the respondent to a poll who says, no, I think it's all pretty good. I think everything looks pretty clean here. You're always going to get numbers that exceed what people's actual actions in terms, you know, shown in elections and so forth seem to say. But again, big picture, I think journalism, all of us collectively have to look at that delta and say, maybe we haven't done a great job here. I would say, I think one thing that kind of complicates it, and I agree with you, Josh, completely, but I think it is the, what we all deal with is this challenge of what what we know Joe Biden was on some of these phone calls. Now, do we know exactly what was said? Even the people who are alleging wrongdoing are saying he didn't say anything other than, hey, how's the weather, right? But yet he was there. And did that help his son? And that sort of feeling that while maybe not illegal, just feels wrong to people. And maybe that's why they're responding the way they're responding. But it is hard to say there is a line between illegality, right? No evidence of anything in that way in any way, right? But is there something perhaps that was improper or doesn't look so good? Maybe. And that I think is the challenge, right? Yeah. You know, I think there's challenges we can rise to. There is this tendency in contemporary political warfare when you have one side making all of these wild 
hyperbolic claims that the fact that you have people making claims that are obviously false, that are obviously knowingly false, that just gets sort of assumed, kind of taken as granted. And he said hi on a phone call. I mean, really? I hear what you're saying. But I think, to me, the overall point still is the reality. I don't think saying hi on a phone call is something that is somehow just short of illegal. I think there's really nothing to any of this with regards to the president. I would say that hi on a phone call obviously is not illegal, but it's also not what the president told us. What he told us is he had nothing to do with this. He certainly was not forthcoming about getting on phone calls in order to impress clients. Clearly, you don't have to say anything. I, you know, I've, I've written about people who have gotten jobs at large organizations, who spent time in the cabinet and other positions. They go to these meetings. They don't actually negotiate any meetings. They don't actually do any business. It's just their presence that is important to the business, right? There's these walk and firms pay people millions of dollars to do nothing other than show up, shake hands, say, hi, I'm the famous person you once saw on television. They don't do any of the business. And in effect, that's what Hunter seems to have been using his father for. Does that mean his father profited from it? No. Does it mean he did anything illegal? No. And there's certainly no evidence that he used his power of his office to do anything. But if there is something I think that even Democrats, some Democrats anyway, find unseemly about it and certainly would criticize in some other context, not an impeachable offense, certainly not proven of any sort at this point. But I think that there is a reason why people feel uncomfortable with it, even if they don't think it's illegal and don't think it's comparable in any way to what Trump is doing. What the Republicans want to do is equate it to Trump in order to muddy the water and say, see, everybody does it. It's not comparable, obviously. Jared Kushner got $2 billion from the Saudis for his investment fund weeks after running Saudi policy in the White House. That's a very different thing. Hunter Biden is a private citizen, never had public office, never had the power to do anything, was never on a White House staff, never affected policy as far as we know. And that's an important context to put there. But I also think it's important to understand what the president told us and and what we're learning. I would be very interested maybe after this episode to see what he said and what we have actually uncovered in terms of his involvement in meetings. Even against the standard of it's not comparable, I think it's pretty weak. Much less against the standard of possible high crimes and misdemeanors. But I think it's a common problem in actually journalism and law. We've just spent six minutes talking about the nuances of things. If the adversary will do a soundbite and actually doesn't mind saying uh, lies about it, Ted Cruz was talking about the mountains of evidence. And if you subdivide, each, each of them didn't hold up for a second. But at the level of receipt by a, an otherwise distracted American public, there is this danger of a kind of what, you know, false whataboutism. Yes, exactly. But I also think in this world we live in, right, you end up, maybe social media, of course, amplifies this, right, and our political climate and the lack of political discourse, right? I mean, it's either evisceration or exoneration, right? And any attempt at nuance or discussion is going to put you immediately on one side or the other, right? It's just a broader thing that I think affects all these conversations. To come back to Josh's point, you asked what he said. I'll look it up right here. In the 2020 debate, Joe Biden, then candidate for office, said, my son has not made money in terms of this thing about what are you talking about? China, I have not. The only guy who made money from China was this guy, meaning Trump. Nobody else has made money from China. That's not the case. Hunter Biden didn't make money from China, as Hunter Biden himself has acknowledged. So there, there, it's not been a completely consistent line. Is that the b- biggest thing in the world? No, I'm not saying it is. But what you're talking about here is not even about Biden. It's about what his son did right. on his own. I mean, look, what he said about it in the midst of a debate. Look, I think maybe the clearest we can say about the political discourse about this issue is that it is very hard to have a conversation in which you have one side speaking in very textured nuance, and the other side talking in just demonstrable lies, right? And visceral and poll-tested ones. So we've already switched pretty much from Hunter Biden to the political landscape. Let's stick there. This was a week where what Susan Glasser has called the rage of the uh, toddler caucus was really on full public display. I hear she's a good columnist. I've heard she's fantastic. (laughs) I never miss her New Yorker columns. And what a great phrase. I hope she's trademarked it, uh, Rage of the Toddler Caucus. So Kevin McCarthy, he's again under fire from the right, and he seems unable to make anything happen. So he agrees to launch this an impeachment inquiry of the president, but without bringing any uh, resolution to a floor vote. What's McCarthy trying to uh, juggle here? 
he's trying to juggle his far right part of his caucus, which is uh, after him and, and, and demanding that he do it. Marjorie Taylor Greene met with President Trump, as we reported in The Times just last Sunday at Bedminster, and said that she told him that she he encouraged her to encourage her fellow Republicans to impeach. And she said that she wanted to make it excruciatingly long and painful for Joe Biden. It's very, you know, the president has done it publicly. It's not even much of a secret. He puts it out there on his social media platform. He says they did it to us. And it's, it was not about what Biden might have done or not. It's all about retribution. That's a word that President Trump has used repeatedly to describe his current mission in life. And so, you know, McCarthy, who just, as you say, 10 or 12 days ago said it would only be done if there was a vote on the floor, not by a single person, then did it by a single person himself and not with a vote on the floor because he couldn't win 218 votes. Everybody agrees at this point. And so it is meant at the moment to seemingly to placate the hard right. They don't seem to be placated, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you never know where this goes. That's the thing. Once you open one of these things, you don't know where it goes. And, and even though he thinks maybe he can control it, you never know. It's amazing. Andrew Kaczynski, our K-file, you know, he's going back and looking at things McCarthy said when Pelosi was in this situation. So obviously, right issue with her doing it unilaterally without a floor vote. And he's gone back on that. But, you know, he found this at this moment. McCarthy sometimes presents himself with very thoughtfully and intently. And, you know, so you hear him a few years ago saying America is weaker for this. We don't have a budget. We're facing a government shutdown. We need to put these things first. And it was so intense and seems genuine. And now here we are, right? No budget facing a shutdown and the exact opposite. And there is something, even in this political climate where nobody means anything they say and everybody expects a flip-flop and cynicism rules the day, it is pretty stunning to see the flip-flop by McCarthy. Especially in 10 days. It would be one thing if he said, look, Pelosi did it, so I'm going to do it. But he said just 10 days ago he wouldn't do it, and then he did. Yeah. He doesn't have the votes. That's the thing today. But the problem is if he got the votes, if he somehow coerced the people who won't vote for it now into voting for it, he knows that that would put him in a much harder position to sustain his majority in the next year. So it's it's kind of the you know two sides of the same coin. And the one thing I think that is important to understand about this whole dynamic is when is Matt Gates or Jim Jordan or whoever going to sort of pull the plug, you know, call for that vote, McCarthy's out. We always have the sense of like okay, the Freedom Caucus, they're going to finally take it to whoever the nominal figurehead of the Republican Party of the moment is that there's some kind of dynamic there. This is what the Freedom Caucus is. It can't exist without a McCarthy or a Boehner type. I'm not sure I would say ineffectual because they are effectual as far as it goes in what they in what they do, but a kind of constantly humiliated nominal leader who presents a face of, in some sense, kind of a mainstream Republican when the president gets together with the Speaker of the House or shows up on TV, but one who is very tractable. And after these various dramas will more or less do what they want him to do, or at least put in effect the dynamics that they want him to. Sort of an example, you know, Matt Gates is on his own little kind of mini jihad here, even within the Freedom Caucus jihad. And one of his big upping the antes was to go on MSNBC a couple of nights ago and attack him on uh, MSNBC. And it was really quite astonishing because, you know, he kept talking about this agreement we have by which he means the agreement that gave McCarthy the speakership back in January. And there's this whole side thing to it where they won't say what the agreement is. And apparently only Chip Roy has a physical copy of the agreement and he won't even share it within the free. Like, I don't know what that's about. Right. But the fun, the funny thing is they keep talking about this agreement. They don't talk of, about the fact that the actual formal political structure with a series of votes made an agreement back in May about how this whole budget thing would play out. And no one's even talking about the fact that that's totally tossed over the edge now, right? Again, I think that's the biggest thing. This isn't something the Freedom Caucus is rebelling against. It's what the Freedom Caucus is. It couldn't exist without a McCarthy, a Boehner, whatever. Because then they would have to kind of run the place in their own right. They need a figurehead. That's a really trenchant point. I wonder, Aaron and Peter, what you think about. So the suggestion is that even when when Gates is rattling sabers, it's not that a failure of nerve, but it's this sophisticated political play that they don't want to oust McCarthy. And maybe he he had this profane tantrum, you know, let him let him try whatever. Uh, yesterday, maybe everyone sort of realizes that. Do you think that sophisticated dynamic is what's going on here? 
Yes. I mean, there's a certain nihilism, obviously, in the House right now in which chaos is a goal unto itself, right? It's not in order to achieve a certain policy goal. Even McCarthy says, I don't even know what they want in terms of this defense bill that we're we're talking about here. I think Josh's point is right. You need, in that position, the, the that part of the House needs somebody to be reacting against, to be fighting against, to be taking on and showing that they're tougher and stronger and more pure or whatever than the establishment, whatever it is. And to some extent, by the way, that can be helpful to a McCarthy figure. What are his real genuine prospects in this whole brouhaha of losing his gavel? That would suggest pretty remote, yeah? Yeah, I would say it certainly seemed to me. I mean, yeah, you know, people like Abby Lowell, oh, the gavel is slipping out of his sweaty hand as he, as we speak. But yeah, what is the alternative? And think about it. I mean, we were all there that night when we got here, right? 15 rounds. They know that there isn't some sort of a figure that's going to come in and change us. And, and I think, as you point out, Peter, sometimes having a foil and having the negative tension is in the interest of both groups. One thing I keep wanting to figure out, and I haven't done it yet, and it kind of, it goes to this question, is if he is removed, then what happens, right? Yeah. I think literally what happens, because I don't think it is formally that he's then the caretaker speaker. But if we remember what happened back in January was that he had already moved into the speaker's office. He was, in effect, already speaker. Now, technically, I believe when there's no speaker, the clerk just basically sits there and keeps taking votes. I think under the standing house rules, the clerk is not speaker, but the rules just say the clerk will continue to hold votes ad infinitum. But if and when that happens, I think McCarthy will say, cool, I'm like, yeah. okay, I'm going to go back to the office and like do my job. And you guys can sit here and just hold votes forever, as far as I'm concerned. I think it is very unlikely. And the only way it would happen is in a way in which it kind of wouldn't matter, which th they would come up with a new guy to play this role. Right. So maybe that could happen, but you're not going to stop having this thing. It's worth remembering. They never got rid of Boehner. He just said, I'm out of here, man. I'm sick of this. Yeah, because they were going to, though. I mean, you know, it wasn't entirely unrelated. No, it certainly wasn't unrelated. But I mean, he pulled the trigger. They didn't. One of the things that's changed in the dynamic of this this week, right, is that there was at least a theoretical possibility before that if a Gates type motion was put in there to vacate the chair that the Democrats might come to McCarthy's rescue. Now, I don't know if that would happen, but it was at least a theoretical possibility. Now, I think because of the impeachment inquiry, that's not a possibility. I think that's just off the table. I'm, I guess, I'm guessing I'm not really as wired in the hill as I would like. Or to. that to the extent it's a possibility, that's the price. Yeah, right. We're not going to sustain your speakership when you're when you're trying to impeach our president. Which then, of course, then makes him ungovernable as a majority Republican, because even a lot of Republicans who don't want necessarily to go to impeachment wouldn't like the Democrats calling the shot. I mean, it's really very messy for him. So there's not a lot of good options. I mean, I, I think that you could get in a situation of real paralysis. I don't think I, I think it's the, the Damocles sword rather than, you know, Damocles sword that never actually falls on you. It's just always hanging there. Right. Yeah. I think that's that's where he's at. So yet another level of dysfunction, the more you peer into the abyss. All right, let's just give a few minutes. He deserves a lot more to Mitt Romney, who announced this week he wouldn't seek re-election. So David Brooks says this marks the end of the Republican Party, going back to Lincoln, the end of the era that once featured people like Lincoln, George H.W. Bush, etc., uh, he'll no longer have any role trying to produce a better GOP future. Is it that seismic in your view? You try to think of a figure who could step into the role he was playing, and it's it's pretty hard to see, right? He gave a voice to the old republicanism in that sense, but he wasn't shaping outcomes. He was not influencing policy. He was not using his status as a moderate to cut deals either cross ideological lines or party lines. I mean, he was a, a singular voice, which is important and not to diminish, but he was not a player in that sense. He was a voice, I guess is what I would say. I don't think we can ever, anybody can take away from him that he voted to convict in the first impeachment. That's just a big deal, no matter how you want to slice it. But I think, and it'll sound like a really cutting remark, he has played a role 
as Peter says, of a sort of a higher volume, higher status Adam Kinzinger, Mm -hmm. kind of a dead to all other Republicans Republican who's up there. And that's very honorable, but it's not shaping, as Peter said, in in any way. He's like a foil to the rest of the of the GOP. To Josh's point, it matters if you don't have a Kinzinger or a Romney or a Liz Cheney in the party in a position to give that voice, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. The lesson now of the last two years is those voices are not only not welcome, but not even permitted. That's what really struck me. He also said that every single member of the caucus holds Trump in contempt. We're talking about the Senate now. Maybe everyone understood that, but you know, he also talked about a someone who was scared to vote for impeachment out of personal safety. I mean, if, if his view is kind of gets purchased in history, it really is a broad condemnation of the whole Republican Senate. We've been focusing on the House. Aaron, do you, do you share the view of his being? I don't want to um, distort what Josh and Peter had to say, but basically almost an honorary figure or just a, a voice from the past, even when he was serving. Chairman, right? Not a CEO. I mean, his role was sort of adding counsel, it felt like. But I do feel that obviously he's a person of deep faith. We know that. And you remember his tears when, when he gave that speech, you know, he teared up on the Senate floor. But at this point, we talk about McCarthy, right? You know, that you can present yourself with such conviction and and come off as so genuine and then it means nothing, right? Mitt Romney's not that, right? We all know that he meant what he said and he said what he meant and he was often deeply conflicted and deeply challenged and tried to do the right thing. And that loss in this environment is, is difficult. But I mean, he also, even amidst all this, and he has other things he wants to do in his life, right? You know, we all see those pictures he posts, right, of his family gatherings, you know, the 60 kids that on the table and, you know, he wants to live his life. And, and, and I think people understand that, but your context here, right. Is Pelosi announces she's running for reelection at 83 Biden's 80 and uh, Trump's 77 average age in the Senate is 65. Right. So even in all this, he's making a statement seems to me speaks for himself, but Hey guys, come on. You know, in the context of all we're seeing with McConnell, right, and all of this. So I do think that he is even now trying to make a statement to all of them. The question is, in these younger people that he says he wants a new generation, who in there has that sort of that morality and that sense of right and wrong and would stand by that and be a person, Josh, as you say, who would stand for nuance and have those conversations? Who Who is there to do that? Non-rhetorical question, right? Is there even a candidate to play that role now, do you think? Does he not leave a vacuum behind and a voice of just forget moderation, just sort of truth telling, you know, among Republicans? He was elected before, well, not pre-Trump exactly, but sort of. You know, in some ways, Mitt has always been a guy who's just not quite sure what he wants to do when he grows up, right? I mean, he 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 tried being governor of Massachusetts for a while, decided not to do that anymore. He ran for president. Then he, you know, he did the Olympic thing. Then he decided he wanted to try a, his his third state and run for Senate. And that's all great. I mean, he's accomplished a lot. I sense you're not down with the hagiography, however, of Mitt Romney. I have a lot of respect for him, how he has navigated the last six years. You cannot take away from him the decision to vote to convict Trump back in 2019. He certainly knew he was ending any future he had as having any real power in the Republican Party by doing that. I think he just did it because it was he could see obviously that it was wrong and that and the trump was guilty of grave misconduct i think it's important though i don't think we should hang it too much on uh nuance what we're really talking about here is can anybody exist within the republican party and identify trump as the person you see in front of you that's what cheney did and that's what adam kinzinger did the 10 republicans in the house right who voted to impeach Trump the second time. That was for January 6th, which is yep, yep. only two of the 10 are even left in Congress, which tells you a lot. Yep. Uh-huh. You know, there's this big book coming out on Romney and we're getting excerpts from it. And I think to, to Josh's point, the counter example is Mitch McConnell, who comes off in some ways as a very poignant figure, sort of really knows it was uh, right and didn't cast the vote. And imagine if he had how different things would have been. Presumably, he's the guy who does stick around and play ball for that reason. How how does 
his legacy now look what you know after a guy like Romney picks up and leaves? I mean, look, he's got McCarthy, right? So if you look at the current Congress, the Biden White House would tell you that McConnell is the grown up in the room and McCarthy is the pain in the butt who is beholden to Trump. McConnell's clearly not beholden to Trump, yet he obviously, you know, as you say, he voted against uh, conviction and then got on the floor and said all the reasons why Trump was guilty. Knowing the conviction was merited, as he actually said in public. Yeah. Now, would that have made a difference? He and his people say no, and they're better vote counters than I am. But it's hard for me not to think that if McConnell had gone the other direction, that that might have given freedom to at least X number more Republicans to go that way. And we see today the consequence of that, because had they voted to convict him, he could not be running today. It would be excluded. 100 percent. And and now from the lawyer point of view, we're in this model of trying to convict Trump. But but it's tricky and it's, it's really unnuanced. And because of the hands-off posture of the White House, et cetera, there just doesn't seem to be a way to kind of work out a deal. The last real clear chance for the sort of consensus disposition of the Trump problem, I think, was when he stood up and voted. But that's now ancient history. It's now time to take a moment for our sidebar feature, which explains some of the issues and relationships that are prominent in the news. Today's feature is about intelligence committees, the committees responsible for providing oversight of U.S. intelligence agencies. And to explain this concept, we welcome R.J. Cutler. R.J. Cutler is an American filmmaker, documentarian, television producer, and theater director. His work includes the documentary films The War Room, A Perfect Candidate, Thin, The September Issue, the World According to Dick Cheney, Listen to Me, Marlin, and the nonfiction television series Black, among many others. Cutler's first film, The War Room, was nominated for an Academy Award. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including an Emmy, a Peabody, a GLAAD Award, two Cinema Eye Awards, and two Television Academy Honor Awards. I give you R.J. Cutler on intelligence committees. There are different committees in Congress that divide and share oversight of U.S. intelligence activities and programs to ensure their constitutionality, effectiveness, and suitability. This is a broad charge as the intelligence community is composed of nearly 18 distinct federal departments. The oversight committees include notably the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. The committees make recommendations about budgeting, audits, and authorizations, among other oversight functions. The Senate Select Committee was established in 1974, and the House Permanent Committee was established in 1977. The Senate Committee has 17 temporary members. Its chair is Democrat Mark Warner from Virginia. The House Committee has 25 members and is currently chaired by Republican Mark Turner. The House Committee also delegates tasks or particular jurisdictions to subcommittees. Its current subcommittees in the 118th Congress, Central Intelligence Agency Subcommittee, National Intelligence Enterprise Subcommittee, Defense Intelligence and Overhead Architecture Subcommittee, National Security Agency and Cyber Subcommittee, and Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. Earlier this year, Republicans in Congress voted along partisan lines to establish a new select subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government. Chaired by Representative Jim Jordan, this new subcommittee was created to supposedly reveal the politicization of federal agencies by Democrats against right-of-center agencies and individuals. Both the Senate and House committees originated in turbulent moments in U.S. intelligence history. After World War II, the Central Intelligence Agency and other intelligence agencies were created or expanded in response to the pressures of the Cold War. These agencies became critical in American foreign policy practice by developing reconnaissance technology and techniques that were key in the Korean War and Cold War proxy conflicts. The failed Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961 marked a major public failure of the intelligence community. With continuing conflicts in Vietnam and the Middle East, however, the intelligence community continued to expand. It was during the turmoil and controversies of the 1960s and 1970s that the intelligence committees became permanent. 
In 1975, President Ford established the Rockefeller Commission to determine if CIA employees were conducting illegal operations in the United States. Following this, the Senate formed the Church Committee and its House counterpart, the Pike Committee. The Church Committee made public several disturbing failures of intelligence programs, including human torture experiments, surveillance of American political organizations, and programs to assassinate foreign leaders. Following these revelations, Presidents Ford and Carter issued executive orders to curb the capacities of intelligence activities, including a ban against political assassinations. The Senate and House formed their respective standing committees on intelligence as a necessary public oversight mechanism. Recent activity of the intelligence committees has included studies of National Security Agency surveillance methods following the Edward Snowden leaks. The Senate Select Committee has also investigated claims of Russian interference in the 2016 election. For Talking Feds, I'm R.J. Cutler. Thank you very much to R.J. Cutler. R.J.'s recent documentary, Billie Eilish, The World's a Little Blurry, is now streaming on Apple TV. And now, a word from our sponsor the American Civil Liberties Union. My name is Malita Picasso, and I'm a staff attorney at the ACLU's LGBTQ and HIV Project, where we work to defend trans people's safety, dignity, and health care across the country. This includes litigation to protect trans youth in Arkansas, Texas, and other states trying to ban their access to life-saving health care. The onslaught of anti-trans bills pushed through state legislatures throughout the nation is truly unprecedented and directly harms a community that already experiences high rates of violence, harassment, and discrimination. As we track and fight these bills, we need your support. Help us build communities where trans youth feel loved and supported. Visit aclu.org slash LGBTQ to learn more and get involved. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thank you, Harry. In today's spirited debate, we hop into the beer cooler to ask the question, to IPA or not IPA? The India Pale Ale has become synonymous with the word Hoppy. And it's that hoppiness that's created a bittersweet relationship with IPAs that has divided beer lovers across the world into two categories. Those who love this style of the pale ale for its full flavored bite with flavors of lemon and pine needle, plus typically higher alcohol content. And then those who prefer a little less sharpness with each sip. So, what gives IPAs that signature bite? Well, there's another abbreviation you should know IBU which stands for International Bitterness Units. The higher the IBU, the more bitter the beer. Luckily, at Total Wine & More, we carry an array of IPAs that offer up a huge range of happiness. We've all been bitten by a hoppy IPA in our past. Swing by your local Total Wine & More and let our guides find you an IPA that's more Y-O-U. So find what you love and love what you find. Only at Total Wine & More. Cheers! Thanks to our friends at Total Wine and More for today's A Spirited Debate. I always love talking about something other than Trump, even glancingly. And pretty big topic this week is the Google antitrust suit, which started. We had opening arguments. What's your thoughts on the cultural significance of this lawsuit in, you know, in 2023 and how it plays for social media in America, et cetera? You obviously know the, the legality of it, right? You've got a few months of a trial and it could result in a total overhaul of Google, you know, whether that's even possible, right? Whether that's even likely. So just putting that aside, when you think about it, right, almost every search in the world is done on Google, right? And now their lawyers are making the argument, well, people do that because they want to. Well, this is sort of like, what is, what is the difference between want and have to? Where do you draw that line? It's kind of the one that works. But it is a company that defines America in a lot of ways, right? I mean, so does Apple, right? 
And I also think that in the context we're in right now of real questions about where we are economically, right, whether we've avoided a recession or whether things are about to get really bad and that question mark out there, tech stocks, look at Google with this question mark hanging over it. You talk about, right? It's up, I think, like 50% so far this year. Almost the entire market gain is due to just a few big tech stocks. So the sort of feeling such that there is one if things are okay and ebullience is being driven by a very small group of very huge technology stocks. And Google is one of them. And with this big question mark over it, I wonder if it hasn't even really permeated into the conversation. So the impact of this economically and to the market could be huge and obviously societally and socially would be seismic, right? Think how long it took to unwind AT&T though. Even if you have a verdict, you're talking about like a 20 year process of like, not literally, but you know, they don't uh, lead Google out in handcuffs. One thing I will say is the law I can't speak to, but I did work very nuts and bolts for 15 plus years in digital advertising. And our publication was one of the uh, beta testers and launch users of what was then Google Ad Manager. Because that's what this is really about. It's about their ad business. Search gives them the data to create an engine that has basically consumed the entire ad business, the, the entire national ad business. And so I, I saw that all very close up. And I don't think without that, I would have comprehended the full depth of Google's monopoly power. That basically all of the entire advertising industry, not just the programmatic industry, every aspect of it is a car race on Google's roads with Google's police officers and Google making the traffic laws. <laughs> and I remember at various points, a few times when I would write about this, I would get invited in to talk about it. And they're all wonderful people, right, within that machine. But when you see it up close and you were able to watch as I did, literally it's creation over time, they control everything. And in fact, like all true monopolies, the monopoly power is so great that they don't even have to take a lot of the problematic actions that are the things that often get true monopolies in trouble in a legal context. Because again, they control everything. And, you know, as <laughs> we have to sort of take the non malign tech companies where we can find them these days. And Google is a fairly white hat operation as tech companies go. Well, that's a really big point here, right? I mean, the at and everyone hated the bell. Everyone hated Microsoft. Uh, Jim Cramer, not a normal authority for me, but he said, the government's going after Google search and Amazon Prime. It's crazy. These are the only things that people like. There is a warm and fuzzy quality to Google, even to your point, when you think of it from consumers, they've driven down the cost for advertisers by 40%. And they would say, yeah, we're totally dominant, but you know, that's because we're good and it's easy enough to change things with a few clicks. Just a very quick legal point is they've definitely maneuvered. So they're not, it's not like Microsoft for them. It's not an existential threat. They've really cabined it down legally. So what would happen would be a, a restructuring basically these advertising deals. It strikes me that people are not as sort of hot and bothered about this case as they were about Microsoft and even Baby Bell. People have, you know, just accepted Google as part of the landscape, notwithstanding what Josh says. Well, it's certainly part of their lives, right? I mean, if you all have the AI, um, you know, when you go to Google now. Oh, my God. Anybody yeah. clicked yes on I want AI in my computer? I mean, it's already there. Did anybody click yes? I, I actively don't, right? But yeah. it is interesting yeah. when you take a thought, think about, you know, what is it? The veil of ignorance you learn about in philosophy. Right. The veil between us and reality in so many ways is Google, right? The more information they get. Have you all had the experience where you have a conversation with someone on the phone and then Google starts sending you things about it, but you <laughs> never wrote about it? So they're actually even listening to you, right? We're sort of living in this Orwellian world and I don't, I don't want to overstate it, right? But where the way we see things and what we're presented with and what we see as reality is controlled by somebody else. And that somebody else, of course, in this context of our day-to-day -day lives, right, is Google. People don't see it as a negative. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. But sometimes when you think about it, it is incredible. 
The one thing I would say is, if I'm recalling this right, notwithstanding the fact that the Biden administration has been as aggressive on the antitrust front as anyone in probably 60 or 70 years, actually, that I think this case actually began under Trump. And most in the Trump stuff was going after a company he didn't like, even if there was a sort of a legal backstory that made it make sense. But what's striking to me is how, albeit for kind of different reasons, the push in an antitrust direction is actually has traction in both parties. And so I don't think it's going anywhere, even if one case fails. And the other point is, it would be a huge deal. But to the extent that people experience Google as ubiquitous, it really wouldn't change, even if they lost in a fairly decisive way. Because no one's really saying that Google search would go anywhere. The question is whether Google search remains tethered to these ancillary businesses that really give it a crazy unfair advantage. The average person has no idea that most of the ads that they see are being either uh, managed or, or purchased through Google. No one knows that. That's opaque. People would be very shocked if suddenly Google search disappeared or if they stood up like Google one, two, and three, right? That <laughs> you'd have to choose between them. But that's not going to happen. It's these things about the geolocation stuff and uh, whether these things are combined. Yeah, which Google analogizes to having, you know, uh, paying a supermarket to have your cereal box uh, at eye level. I think the case, there's a divide, I'll just say, between the antitrust legal significance and the cultural significance. And I, I think we live in a world where that power people have accommodated themselves to or even welcome more than was the case with Microsoft or Baby Bells. Whether that should matter at the end of the day, you know, is a broader question than the trial will answer. Sad to say we are out of time in this fantastic discussion. I wish it could go one more hour. But thank you very much to Aaron, Josh, and Peter. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also now subscribe to us on the Talking Feds channel on YouTube, where we are posting full episodes, talking books, and bonus video content. You can follow us on Twitter at Talking Feds Pod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon, where we post bonus discussions with national experts about special topics exclusively for supporters. This past week, we posted a conversation with Professor Joshua Tucker about the relationship between the algorithms that Meta Facebook employs and the political polarization in the United States. Talking Feds is a completely independent production, so if you like the work we do and are inclined to support the show, joining our Patreon is the best way to do it. Submit your questions to questions at TalkingFeds.com, whether they're for Talking 5 or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments. Thanks for tuning in, and don't worry. As long as you need answers, the Feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Mal Meliez, associate produced by Catherine Devine, sound engineering by Matt McArdle, our research producer is Zeke Reed, Rosie Don Griffin and David Lieberman are our contributing writers and production assistants by Meredith McCabe, Akshaj Turbailu, and Emma Maynard. Our gratitude, as always, to the amazing Philip Glass, who graciously lets us use his music. Talking Feds is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later. <laughs>